I'm Alain Stellion, the Midlife Empowerment Coach, and today I am thrilled to introduce Dr. Margaret Robinson Rutherford. Dr. Uh, Rutherford, a clinical psychologist, has practiced for 28 years in Fayetteville, Arkansas. She began blogging in 2012 and podcasting in 2016, extending the walls of her practice so that the general public could hear more about what therapy has to offer. Her writing can be found on her website, as well as Psychology Today, the Gottman blog, and others. She also hosts a highly popular podcast, The Self Work Podcast, which is consistently ranked in the top 50 of US mental health podcasts. In her new book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, <laughs> focuses a much needed light on the dangerous link between destructive perfectionism and depression. So Margaret, welcome. I'm just so excited to have this conversation with you today. And I wanted to start by, since I am, and we were talking about this before, all about empowering women in midlife, I'd love for you to talk to us a little bit about your life's journey because it's had some twists and turns, I understand. It's been a bit circuitous, that's for sure. I want to say though, when I walk into my house tonight, the first thing I'm gonna tell my husband is, I want you to know that I'm fascinating. <laughs> all right, all right. And I expect to, you know, hear that from you. So anyway, thank you. For yes, that. exactly. To be referred to as the fascinating. The <laughs> yes, yes. I think that's a word for you. Absolutely. Oh, well, you know, whatever. So yes, I, um, gosh, I never thought I'd be a psychologist. I'd gotten a lot of therapy in my 20s, but I was a, a professional vocalist. I sang jingles in studios, that's TV and radio advertisements, and during the day, and then I had, off and on, I had jazz groups or whatever, I tried my hand at rock and roll, and I was awful, and so, I mean, really awful, so um, I started singing jazz, and I had a little group, and we worked at the different hotels, and it was, I mean, people go, oh, that's such a neat way to, to live, and right. it was, but it also had its downside. And one of the downsides was I looked around as I was singing in the studio and I thought there are not very many old <laughs> or even older uh, uh, jingle singers with the exception of a couple of men. So I thought, you know, I, I might need to think my life would go in another direction. And I'd had this young man um, come on this on the, into the into our group uh he subbed one night and he was talking about getting a degree in music therapy oh well now that sounds interesting i had been volunteering at the domestic violence shelter in dallas and and really loved that trying to help and so i looked into it i put all the money down i had in the world for that first year at smu and and got a music therapy degree however my very last rotation or internship, it was called, was in a psych hospital. And I was watching the psychologist there and I had been in therapy myself. And I thought, oh, no, 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 no. This is what I want to do. I did not have a psychology degree. So I had to take a whole nother year just to pick up enough psychology hours to to um, try to get into a program. And I, I will admit to you, I did get into a couple. One of them was actually, the one I ended going to was a very good program. And I, a secretary about two years into it called me into her office and she said, I wanna tell you something. And I said, okay. And she said, you were kind of let in as a curiosity. We, <laughs> we had never had a, a singer want to be a psychologist. And so we kind of said, well, you know, I heard him talking and they said, well, you know, she's a, not quite traditional, but, and I was older because I was in my early thirties when I started that program. So um, yeah, so I went from literally closing down the Fairmont hotel at one o'clock in the morning and nine years later, saw my first patient as Dr. Rutherford. So it was quite a journey. And then, as I told you before we got started with this or started recording, then about eight or nine years ago, I, I had a lot of time on my hands because my son had left for college. I thought, well, I just kind of need something new to do. And actually one, probably, you know, Melissa Schultz, um, is someone who really um, encouraged me because she's a professional writer 
And she said, I think you've got something, you know, that would be valuable. And so I started writing and bless anyone who actually read any of my first posts because they were way too long. <laughs> But yeah, and so I started in 2012, then I started the podcast in 2016. I promise you, at the age of 61, I was the oldest person taking the podcasting class. But I started the podcasting, and then now I have a book. So it's just been incredible. So it's really my third career. And it's, um, of course, I use a lot of the things that I've learned as a psychologist as in, in the podcast and in writing, but still it feels very different than just sitting and talking with people and trying to, uh, trying to help them and guide them in the, in the direction they want to go. It's just been, it's been so fulfilling. And I get to talk with people like you. <laughs> well, you're such a good role model for women as we get older to not limit themselves and to actually expand their horizons and you know, if you've been doing the same thing for a while, maybe to mix it up a little bit and find a new way for your voice to carry a little further. And you have such a strong sense of mission with what you do that I think, you know, why not try to put it out there in a different way that may reach more than your one-on-one -on -one clients be able to go a little further than that. So, And that's exactly what I say on my podcast. I wanted to extend the walls of my practice is what I say. Because one of the things, Helen, that I was, I'm still uh, distraught about or distressed about is how many people don't understand therapy. They don't understand what really happens. They, they think it's about giving up control. They see it as a weak thing to do. Um, and I just, I just don't believe, in fact, I think it's a very courageous thing to do because it is hard to reveal your vulnerabilities. And it's, it's hard to develop a relationship with someone where you, you allow yourself to explore things that are kind of painful. And I think a therapist is simply like any other consultant, you, you know, if you're going to get a divorce, you go to a lawyer. If you, if you have a plumbing problem, you call a plumber, you don't try to fix it yourself. And so um, I, you know, I think a therapist is a lot like that. We are, we are uh, agents of change in many ways, but we're also, we have all this experience seeing people and seeing people probably that are just like you. And then we want, or have the similar problems as you do. And we have watched them or guided them, however, in their journey. And I, I've often said, I feel like I'm a conduit between the people I've seen in the past and the people I'm seeing now, because I pull on the wisdom of those people I've already seen. I learn so much from my own patients. So, uh, and in fact, one of my patients said one time, she is a mentor to people in, in, in the business world. And she said, there's a question I ask everyone. She said, what are you uniquely positioned to do that will fulfill you? And so I would say to a 40 year old, a 50 year old, a 60 year old, a 70 year old, what are you uniquely positioned to do that you would feel fulfilled and you would be giving something and, and creating something that would be meaningful for you. I just think that's an awesome question to ask someone. I, I think it's fabulous. And it's exactly, it dovetails so well with what I do, which, you know, in helping women find a purposeful life, create a purposeful life for themselves. So I love that too. And People often say, you know, what did, therapists do and what that's really that I learned that phrase in graduate school that was you know psychology 101 <laughs> what is a therapist and it's an agent of I'm an agent of change and because I believe steadfastly actually that insight is very very helpful it helps you connect the dots it gives you ways to see the patterns in your life both mm -hmm. positive and painful but yeah. where you get hope is from changing your choices, changing your, your emotional reactions, changing your thought patterns, changing your behavior. And I'm a very, um, not a solution oriented, I wouldn't say, but as a therapist, I'm very proactive. I'm always saying, well, what can we do about it? Even though it's tiny, what can you do about it? Yeah. And so I think that change is something that, I mean, people don't come to me unless they're demoralized in some way. Right. So 
it's about reminding them of their strengths or finding strengths or building skills that they didn't know they had or they didn't possess and and, and helping them make the changes they want to make. Um, yeah. I was definitely, a, I was a nuclear reactor in my 20s. <laughs> That's why I was in therapy. I reacted to this and reacted to that and I made a lot of chaos. In fact, my dad, Helen, used to call me and he'd say, Margaret, how's your practice going? And I'd say, well, dad, you know, knock on wood, it's it's doing okay. And he'd kind of look, sit back in his chair and he goes, you know, you made so many mistakes in your own life. There's not too much you can't understand. <laughs> you can relate to all your patients. Nice, dad. Thanks, dad. And you know what? He's actually accurate. I mean, I, you know, I haven't, I've made every mistake in the book, but I certainly have made a bunch of them. So well, um, and we learn so much from our mistakes, right? I mean, so much more than we do from things that come easily to us. Our struggles really inform us. So I, I, I'm in agreement uh, there. Um, oh, yeah. And I don't want to go too far afield because I think we could talk about therapy forever, but we are here to discuss your book and your concept. So I would love to understand a little bit more about um, the link between perfectionism and depression, because that is really, it sounds like that's really central to perfectly hidden depression. It is. And let me uh, just tell you a little bit of the story of how this book came yes. to be. <clears throat> I was writing back in 2014, two years after I started writing, I was just going to write my normal weekly blog post, but I thought about some people that I had seen over the years that when they came in, I, I'm, I didn't think they were depressed. They didn't look depressed in the classic sense. And yet what I began to see was that they also, what, what um, connected them, what was similar between them was they had almost an inability to express painful emotions. They had an inability to, to talk about or even to define something that had happened in their lives as traumatic. And so I sat down to write about these people, these people who look successful and, and they're funny and they're engaged and they're a great friend and they've got the perfect looking life. And, you know, maybe they've got the five pounds they need to lose and jokingly call it their baby fat after their baby is 18 years old. But, you know, it, it's kind of these people that, that look great. But when you start listening closely, um, you see that there is this discounting or denial or inability to look at more painful things. And so I, 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 I wrote a post called the perfectly hidden depressed person, are you one? And I just pulled that term out of the air. Well, it went viral. I'd never had a post go viral at all. And I was writing for the Huff Post at the time, and I'd forgotten that I left my email on the bottom of the post. Oh. Well, literally, Helen, I got hundreds in a 24 hour period of time, hundreds of emails. And this is me. How did you get in my head? I've never heard of this before. So I got curious and I thought, well, is nobody else writing about this? And to, to make a long story short, over several years, I found, of course, Brene Brown's work. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone who wrote yesterday in your discussion of this session said, you know, mentioned Terrence Reel's book, I Don't Want to Talk About It, which is a great book, but it's about covert depression in men. And I didn't ever see this connection in the popular literature between someone maybe being very depressed, but not fitting any kind of classical symptom checklist, you wouldn't say any of that about them, but they are also depressed. So it's about the way they are um, carrying themselves and appearing to the outside yeah. world. Yes. Differentiating them from the traditional can't get out of bed depression. Yes. Yes. Great way to put it. Um, they are their symptomatology would not look like classic depression symptomatology. Now, let's make the distinction between what's called high functioning or smiling depression, 
with what I call right. perfectly hidden depression because high functioning or smiling depression exists big time. There are plenty of people who are no, they're clinic, they're depressed, they've sought help, they've gone to therapy, they're on medication, they exercise, they manage their moods, and they slap a smile on their face and they don't go around talking about how depressed they can get. There are lots of those okay. folks. And those folks may actually be attracted to the book and it could be helpful to them. But there's another set of people where this defensive strategy, this I need to look perfect. I need for other people to see me as having a perfect looking life. I need to constantly meet the expectations of others. I need to, um, um, well, I, I need to uh, present myself as, as somehow completely put together and in control. What happens is that those people have adopted that strategy for so long, and they probably adopted it in childhood, that it has become that kind of pushing away of pain has become an, almost an unconscious thing. When you think about when you first learned to drive a car, you know, you were white knuckling it and you had to think about every little step. Well, that gradually, sometimes we drive to work and we don't even think about driving at all. It's just like we got there. And so that is what these folks, a lot of these folks do or have done. And, and, and yet what is also very um, substantive to realize is that this kind of perfectionism isn't constructive. This kind of perfectionism is destructive because it's fueled by shame. It's, these people have constant critical voices going on in their head you're not this enough. If you're not that enough, people are going to find out who you really are. They're going to reject you um, constant. So their perfectionism isn't fueled by a sense of fulfillment. It's, it's, there's no fulfillment in this because it's constant, constantly fighting the battle with self-criticism and shame. Wow. And, and there's a lot of fear there, it sounds like. Oh, intense fear. Yeah. Intense fear. Um, I've had people say to me, if I let anyone in on the way I really am, I will, I will lose my job. I will lose my friends. People will think I've lied to them. People will see me as, a, as phony. Uh, people will, uh, they, I'll, I'll, I mean, I had a, a lawyer in here last year when I was still seeing patients in the office. And he said, you know, I, I, can't seem like I don't know the answer all the time. That's what people hire me for is I, I know the answer. And yet sometimes, you know, you, you have to say, I'll have to think about that. I'm not real sure what the answer is. Let me go look that up. And that's, that's okay. That's vulnerability. But yeah. vulnerability scares the crap out of these people. I mean, vulnerability is, is scary in general, right? I think it's just to, to most people, but it sounds like it's particularly intense, uh, you know, with this subset. And it sounds like this is a subset then of high functioning depressed people, right? So it's a, the, the it perfectly different. hidden de depressed people is, okay. I, I see them as, as a little different in that uh, some of these people I mean, when they say, I've never heard of this, are you inside my head? They don't think they're depressed. In fact, they're shocked when someone like me says to them, do you realize you're depressed? Because they said, well, I, but I, I, I'm so grateful. I have so many blessings in my life. I, I can't, I'm not depressed. And they're not depressed in the classic sense. But when they get alone and when they get quiet, which is rare, then these feelings of maybe even suicidality and intense loneliness and despair and fear and insecurity are there. Yeah. They're, it, but they just, it takes a lot of encouragement and guidance and, and safety for them to be able to set, to let down those defenses. Um, yeah. I've, I've, I had a woman who she was, um, in fact, I was seeing her while I was actually writing the book and she was a, an incredibly eloquent woman. And she would say things in session that I'd say, 
can I use that in the book? <laughs> That's a great way to think about it. And, and she said, you know, before I started this work, she worked from home. And so she was, um, had weekly meetings with her supervisor. And she said, you know, I would get on the call and I would have to know the answer to the question that he was going to ask me before he even asked it. Yeah. And I, I never allowed myself to look like I wasn't, um, uh, on top of things, on top of it, got it handled, got it handled. And, and she also told me that around two, two 30 in the morning, one morning, she she, her gut knew something was wrong and she got up and she actually looked up depression and, and she looked down the checklist and she said, I'm none of these. Right. I'm not hopeless. I'm not helpless that she would admit. Um, and she shamed herself even more for mm. questioning whether she could be depressed or not. And so these folks are so wrapped up in shame and fear, as you point out, that they, they're, very, they're leading very emotionally restricted lives. Yeah. Um, and she also told me at the end of treatment, she said, you know, I had a plan to kill myself um before I came in and now I wouldn't dream of that she had been through intense loss surrounding miscarriages and infertility and it always looked happy and like she had it and just we got to do it try next month and then something happened in her life that was a very positive thing about having a child and she broke down and she didn't understand why she broke down and great gradually she began to understand that she had years of grief that she had never even connected with. And so when she actually began mothering, that's when the grief hit her like a, a wall. And, and she, you know, she, she was so afraid of what she was going to do. So she was wonderful to work with and she got, yeah. she did great work. It sounds like a lot of this is resonating with the, with the, the people who are watching us live right now. And I know in your book, you've got checklists for people who are wondering, you know, yeah, I mean, how do I know if I have perfectly hidden depression? You've got um, tools in the book that really can take you down the checklist and kind of recognize whether you fit the criteria for this. You know, again, I'm not narcissistic enough to believe that I have come up with an idea that nobody else has ever come up with. I, I had a clinician say to me, in fact, last year at some point, he said, you know, we all know this exists. You just put a name to it. And I mean, I said, but that's huge, actually, no, because yeah. said, people who are going online and saying, there's, that's a real disservice that there's this one idea of what depression looks like. And if you don't fit the bill, then you're not depressed, but then you might go and harm yourself. I mean, that's, that's not helping anybody. So putting a name to something and making it more concrete and live and real, I think is huge. Well, thank you. I, I call it a syndrome. It's not a diagnosis. It's a syndrome, kind of like codependence is a syndrome. I, you know, codependence is this group of behaviors and beliefs that tend to fall together. And these are from initially, they were talking about people who are in relationships with alcoholics and that they're codependent. And so that, were, that word has morphed into a whole bunch of other stuff. But yes, I do identify 10 different traits that someone can see in themselves. I also have a questionnaire that's not empirically validated that if you score high on it, um, uh, then typically, you know, I say you've got to what your perfectionism is getting to be a shield instead of being something that's really fulfilling and innately, um, innately wonderful. I mean, you enjoy working that hard, but you can accept mistakes. You see whatever you're trying to do. Again, this is constructive perfectionism. You see it as a process and growth. That's not how someone with perfectly hidden depression or destructive perfectionism feels. They, they are so accomplishment oriented, task oriented. They've got to exceed or meet the expectations of other people. And as soon as they have, they move on to the next expectation. Right. So it is a grinding, grueling way of living your life rather than, oh yeah, I did that really well. Wow, you know, fantastic. 
Mm -mm, these a moment to celebrate. Yeah, it sounds exhausting, honestly. It is exhausting. She asks, is, is self-esteem tied to this, like low self-esteem? Yes. Um, it is, again, there's sort of a superficial esteem. Uh, they've, they've created a life that other people see as successful. This guy that I worked with, uh, who was a kind of a serial, he had serial affairs. He had three or four affairs. And he said to me somewhat wryly and ironically when he came in, he said, you know, I have people walk up to me and my wife all the time and say, y'all just have a perfect family. How have you pulled this off? You're such great parents. You're such, but he had these secrets that he knew he was keeping. And, and they were things he was very ashamed of. And so, you know, whether those secrets are in your present, whether in your past, but they are affecting your esteem, but you've got to hide that. Um, you know, people ask me, well, what causes this? And my best answer for that is that this is a strategy that's devised in childhood that is a emotional survival strategy. We, we actually all do this. You know, if you're lucky enough to grow up in a really healthy, wonderful family, good for you. But many of us are not. And so, uh, you know, we, at, in order to survive abuse or neglect or having an alcoholic parent and you become, you know, it, your role becomes to take care of your siblings, whether you're the star of your family and you learn that I only get, you know, my parents are so proud of me and they've done so much. I've got to keep on accomplishing and keep on accomplishing and keep on accomplishing or um, in mesh, or, but, you know, simply families that you grow up in and no one is allowed to talk about pain. Mm. You know, you, your mother died when you were five and all the pictures of her were gone and your father remarried quickly and expected you to call this person mommy and you're not allowed to talk about your mother or you're just not allowed to talk about being tired or sad or angry go to your room you know when yeah. you can be nice come back out yeah. so a lot of us grow up in those kinds of families so we learn this strategy we take we we build this strategy that i'm going to look like i'm I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm highly successful. I'm highly engaged. I'm accomplished. I'm, and yet the core of you is still very, it has been hurt. It has been, um, you're not seen. And so you, you develop this mask. Well, if I'm not going to be seen, then I'm gonna make that okay by developing a mask and letting people see this, but it's not okay. It's never okay. Um, I had a man laughing in my office, just sitting right over there. And he was laughing. He said, yeah, my mom used to throw rocks at me and tell me I would never amount to anything. <laughs> he thought it was so funny. Well, the truth of his story was that he had retired from a very successful job he had done it extremely well, but after retirement, he was falling apart because what was happening was the affirmation he got from mm -hmm. that job, he no longer received. And so he was back to not knowing how to feel okay about himself, you know, gonna prove his mother wrong. And so I looked at him and said, you have a grandson? He said, yeah. I said, um, would you throw rocks at him? Let's ask him to go into the front yard and let's throw rocks at him and scream at him that he'll never amount to anything. And he got this horrified look on his face. And he said, I'd never do that. I said, but you're still that little boy. You remember that. There's a part of you that hasn't healed from that because you're still dependent on that mask, that accomplishment to you know, help you feel okay. And without it, you're drinking too much and you, you, you're, you're wandering around. And so the healing comes in going back and acknowledging those hurts, not blaming anybody, just acknowledging that those hurts and that need for that mask existed. And the more you acknowledge and have self-compassion and self-acceptance that to know that you do have some vulnerabilities because of that, and that's okay. That's self-acceptance.
And so you, we, that's the whole, I, I say the antidote to perfectly hidden depression is self-acceptance, allowing your strengths and your vulnerabilities to coexist. Being a whole person, you know, yeah, the, uh, with, with human, flawed, all of it. And, and I also, it's interesting you bring up the, uh, I, uh, in my therapy, I talk a lot about, uh, with my therapist about the adaptive behaviors we developed as children, yep. which served us well then. They were yes. survival mechanism, coping tools. We didn't know anything else. So it's also not about like, you know, why did I become this way and how could I, whatever it, you, you did good. Like you did all right. you knew how to do. It's just that now as an adult, they become, they can become destructive and maladaptive at some point. And you now have the wherewithal and, and with some help to be able to, exactly. to get through, to do some point. Exactly. I, for example, um, was highly enmeshed with my mom, uh, meaning we were far too close. She was far too into my life. And, um, and so I learned as my emotional survival strategy that I, I was one of those kids that I just would do stuff and then tell her I'd done it because, you know, she would be so protective and she was smothering. I was kind of a sickly kid. So guess what that looked like in adulthood? That looked like me never asking for advice, being completely independent, not, I mean, I was so, uh, I mean, I, I, that's what I said. I was a nuclear reactor. I, I just did whatever I wanted to do. And, you know, that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. And I had to realize the damage I was doing to myself as an adult. And I had to change my strategy. So I'm curious to know um, whether this is something that you see across all demographics. You've talked about both men and women. And I, when I think of perfectionism, oftentimes I think of women. I don't know why, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but it sounds like you see this across the board. I do, I do see it across the board. Um, I, in the book, I, I have um, about 30 stories I didn't want to do some dry chapter about the etiology of perfectly hidden depression, you know, can be found in. So we told stories and it, actually I interviewed about 60 people and who had a, who volunteered to come forward and talk about it. Sometimes they were whispering in their garages or their backyards because they didn't want anybody to know that they were talking to me. But um and I compiled their stories anonymously, of course. And so the stories you read in the book are real stories. And, um, and they're men and women both. I mean, um, and so, and I've had African-Americans come to me and say, you know, we had to be the most accomplished people in our class or we didn't get any attention. We were told we couldn't do it at all and we weren't yeah. supposed to do it. So, and now you're suggesting I give that up. <laughs> I said, no, I'm just suggesting that you recognize how that became such a strategy and you have some compassion for yourself so that, you know, you're not all bound up in it still. But, you know, minorities yeah. have that as an issue as well. I mean, I, um, you know, I didn't talk about that a lot in the book and it's been interesting to me after, you know, and I knew that I, I knew that I would, as soon as the book was published, that there would be things I'd figure out or something else I'd learn. Um, and in fact, I talk in the book about, you know, I feel very vulnerable knowing I'm writing an imperfect book about mm -hmm. perfectionism. And, and it almost stopped me in my tracks a couple of times. I've almost said, I can't do this because um, I don't, it won't be completely right because I also have a perfectionistic streak. So, um, but I got over that. And um, so it's something that I've tried to write about in my blog post and things like that since the book came out. Yeah, so I this has been so fabulous, but I, I know we're we're coming up on time and I've taken up so much of your time. But I would love for you to tell our viewers a little bit more about um, how to you know work with you or you know how you work with people. I know you've got. I'm going to put the link to your website and also um, link to your podcast, which so right. people will be able to 
find you and learn more about you and your work. Um, I don't know if you also work individually with uh, clients from anywhere or how that goes. No, psychologists um, can't do that. Life coaches can. But um, now there are some states that have agreements uh, between states where your licensure is accepted in another state, but we are licensed for a certain state. So I can see anybody in the right now. Now, Arkansas legislature is looking at looking at something called psych psych um, psych pact or something like that psych pact that's it uh, but it hasn't been passed in as by the legislature yet so i can only work as a therapist with people from arkansas okay well but, yeah. but i have a facebook closed group which has about 2600 members and i you know i am one voice in that but it, i mean you know i do comment on people's uh uh, posts as, as do other people. And we've got some great wisdom in that group. And that's at facebook.com slash groups slash self-work, facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. Yes. My podcast is the self-work podcast. And, um, I've been doing that for, this is my fifth year. And I am proud to say that we have surpassed 2 million downloads and so, and I have a great team that helps me put that together. That's why I say we, I'm not like the queen, we. It's just, it is a we, it's not just a me. Um, and so uh, you can find me there. My website is drmargaretrutherford.com. Um, and, you know, I, people say, well, do other therapists know about this? And interestingly enough, that's beginning to grow. I hear from people who say, my therapist suggested I read this book. Um, but no, you can't walk in a, in a psychologist's office and say, do you treat perfectly hidden depression? They go, what in the heck are you talking right. about? So unless they've looked at my book, but the book is doing pretty well and actually uh -huh. in many ways better than I thought. We're in our second printing. So that's good. And, yeah. um, and in the book itself, it has 60, over 60 exercises that I put together pretty painstakingly um, to try to take you from, you know, not wanting to be vulnerable at all with anybody ever to gradually and slowly and carefully guiding you to look at things differently. So the book is actually kind of a workbook, um, although we don't call it that. So that's something else you can try. And if you get into deep water, too deep of water, obviously go to a therapist. Absolutely. And yes, I'm getting some questions about the Facebook group. I will link to um, Dr. Rutherford's Facebook group in the comments as well, because there's a lot of interest from um, uh, some of the women who would like to join. And it is free to join. You don't have to write. Oh, it's totally free. And because it's a closed group, it's private. Uh, yes. Only the people in the group. Now, and I don't have any criteria. Uh, there are some questions you need to answer just to let me know you're not there to sell some product or something. Right. Um, right. And, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I get on there at least once a day and we have people from all over the world and the commentary is, is um, you know, we don't talk politics or religion. Um, yep. We're just there to support each other and, and just try to learn from one another. And I, I, I love the group. I think it's a very special group. Wonderful. Well, I will be sure to link the group as well. And one more time uh, for everybody who's watching, Dr. Rutherford has uh, kindly agreed to autograph yeah. one of her books, send it to somebody. All you have to do by the end of the weekend is to um, comment on this live and uh, you know either live or replay and let us know you were here so that we can do the drawing and uh, she will send you an autographed book. Um, I'd love to do that. Yeah, so thank you so much uh, for joining us and I really so appreciate your wisdom and your uh, shining a light on um, a, a hidden uh, syndrome that uh, it sounds like is resonating with a lot of people uh, who do not find themselves to fit the criteria of traditional depression that's in the DSM. So. I will quickly tell you one story really quickly. It'll yeah. take me a minute. In last May, I was contacted by some women in Florida who said, we really need to talk to you. And so I, we contacted one another and one of their friends who had exactly the kind of life I'm talking about, successful, engaged, three children in her mid forties, attractive, everything, hung herself. 
Oh. And her husband found my book on her night table, her bedside mm -hmm. table. I don't want there to be any, I mean, I know I can't prevent all of that from happening, but mm -hmm. I, I got, I cried when I heard that story. I am passionate about getting this message out. So thank you to you, Helen, for, for helping me do that. Thank you to anybody who was here and listening. Please, um, you know, if you know someone like this or if you're someone like this, please consider getting help and, um, and just allow yourself to realize that, you know, again, your vulnerabilities do not define you any more than your strengths do.